to share with you. And uh, I want to start in uh, Galatians chapter 5. And there's a, there's a passage there that's, I, I don't preach on it very often, actually, um, but it's, it's kind of a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's pretty fundamental, actually. It's one of, those, one of the first things you learn as a Christian, oftentimes. Uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talks about uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and right before that, it talks about the works of the flesh. I'm not going to read that part right now, but, you know, it's kind of contrasting, you know, the fallen nature of man infected by sin and, and all that and what that produces, the fruit it produces and the actions that it produces. And then, and then Paul goes into uh, the fruit of the Spirit, which is a person who's born again. Uh, and if, you, uh, if you're allowing God to live inside of you and transform you on the inside and, you know, live, live through you, really, live in you and live through you, uh, then he describes this. He says, this is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Uh, go back to 22. He was also talking in Galatians about the, uh, the reason he said against such there is no law because part of the theme of Galatians is, you know, not, we're not under law anymore, you know, that the law was for people that were not born again, you know, to, to reveal their need for a savior. But he's saying, uh, this is the fruit of when you're born again. No, we're not living by law now, and all these things are above the law. They're, they're, a, they're a supernatural fruit of God's presence in your life. So let's go back to this idea. The fruit of the Spirit. Um, fruit is what? Something that grows, right? It's just, yeah, it's, it's something that grows. And uh, I know that people have kind of, um, in the theological world, debated a little bit. Is this all the same fruit, just being described in a bunch of ways? Or is there like nine fruits? You know, and if you go to Sunday school, sometimes you have the nine fruits of the Spirit. And they, you know, make little apples and peaches and bananas. And they call them love and joy and peace, which is cool and, and cute. And, and it helps the kids understand. Uh, but uh, again, the question, is there nine separate fruits or is really just one fruit? You know, and uh, it's probably really one fruit. And it says the fruit of the Spirit. Because you don't actually see a tree producing apples and oranges and bananas, do you? You see a tree producing one thing. And so really this, this, um, this tree here uh, in, our, in our example is producing one fruit. And that fruit is the nature of God. That's really what it's talking about, right? So when, when you're born again and God is living in your heart, there's going to be a fruit that is produced. It's going to change your nature on the inside, your very nature, who you are on the inside, right? So profoundly, so fundamentally, that it's going to it literally transform you before people's eyes. Sometimes that process happens quickly. Sometimes it takes a while. That's okay. <laughs> I guess it you know, depends maybe how much we, uh, we let, you know, spend time with God and let Him live in us. But essentially, what this uh, little passage is saying, the fruit of the Spirit is really, um, you know, God's presence living in us, transforming us, and becoming who we are, and it grows like fruit. And uh, that's another cool thing about this is fruit isn't something that you manufacture yourself, is it? You don't, you don't, you know what I'm saying? You don't put it together. There's no sweat that goes into it. Fruit just grows, doesn't it? Fruit is just, it just grows. It's just produced. The only thing you have to have is a healthy tree. If you've got a healthy tree, it's an apple tree or, or an orange tree, whatever it is, if the, if the tree is getting sunshine, if the tree is getting water and the nutrients and it's rooted in a good place, it's just going to make fruit, right? It just does. And that's the same thing, that if you're, if you're having a relationship with God, it's really all you need, right? This isn't something you sweat for and try to put on and try to work up and try to, you know, kind of go against your whole nature and be someone you're not, you know? This is something that just literally grows inside of you from the presence of God, right? And all you really have to do is just feed your tree, you're the tree, right? With, with the presence of God, with his love, with his presence, his anointing, his word. And as you just feed on these things, it'll just grow, right? It'll just grow. And uh, so it describes this again, the fruit of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, of course, is, is the third person of God, actually lives inside of you. And it says it's love, joy, and peace. And these are essentially, love, joy, and peace are essentially, um, you, how, how do I want to say this? This is a revelation, this verse is a revelation of God's essential nature. Because if God himself wasn't love, joy, and peace, would his presence inside of you produce love, joy, and peace? You know what I'm saying, right? If God is essentially like an angry God or a, you know what I'm saying? If he's, if he's a God that you should be a, a really afraid of, if he's a God that's, you know, really um, 
un unfair and you know what I'm saying? Judgmental and condemning and angry or whatever. Is he going to, at the same time, produce love and joy and peace in you? No, everything reproduces after its own kind, right? And so what the, the, what the simple thing that this verse is saying is that if God's living in you produces love and joy and peace, then that is an absolute revelation and expression of who God is by nature. God is by nature love and joy and peace. And I know I talk a lot about God is love. Um, that's, that's a pretty major theme for us here. But it also says God is joy. It's not, it's not just, and a joy is not an emotion, is it? Happiness may be an emotion. Happiness may be very, you know, conditional. But things are going well for me today. I'm pretty happy. You know, oh, things just turned around. Now my day's not going so good. I'm not happy anymore, right? You know, and, and, and happiness is an emotion. And, and there's lots of emotions, you know, that, that, that are very temporary and very conditional. But joy is a spiritual Force Joy is a spiritual what? It's, a, it's this essential nature of God. I don't know how else to express in that. God is joy as much as he is love. I mean, it is literally joy. <laughs> you know? and, and so it's funny when, when people, when Christians um, get the idea somehow that getting close to God means you become very stern and very religious and very, you know, very rigid in your ways and you know like you got baptized in lemon juice and you know and that's someone who's really close to God um, something went wrong in the understanding there because God's essential nature is joy <laughs> I mean, no other way to say that God is joy and so if you're letting God live in you and live through you joy is going to bubble up Right? And when you spend time with God, I mean, joy isn't something you can put on, is it? It's not like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work up some joy today because it's biblical. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, no, you just, you just go to God. Say, God, here I am, live in me. Right? Here I am. I just want to be aware of your presence and just want you to touch me and move in me and, and just pour into me and love on me, God. And as you do, you'll find, guess what, just bubbles up inside of you. Joy. It does. It just does. And joy is a spiritual force that may absolutely contradict all the circumstances around you. You may be feeling like, man, my job is just a drag and, you know, I just, it's so frustrating and my circumstances right now, you know, my refrigerator just broke again, you know, and I, and I want to replace it or whatever the thing is, you know, and, and yet um, whatever the circumstances are, if you, if you just get quiet in God, say, God, Right? Just be aware of his presence in you and, and drink of his presence. You know what bubbles up inside of you in the face of any circumstance? Joy. It's just God's, it's who he is. It's his nature, you know. And so how do you know if somebody's really close to God? <laughs> Joy. Not sternness, not religiosity, not talking in King James English even. Joy, right? Joy that bubbles up, joy that just defies circumstances sometimes, right? That just flies in the face of, you know, difficult circumstances and joy. And you're like, oh, you do walk with God, don't you? Because you can't fake joy very, very long. You could fake it for like 30 seconds, and then, it's, then you get tired, right? <laughs> but, but real joy just, just flows. Right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and then peace. Fundamentally, God's nature also is peace. And I, I can attest to that in an amazing way. I've, I've shared it with you maybe a couple of times in the past. Uh, many of you have had heavenly experiences of some form or another. Some of you have, right? If you've had a, whether it's visionary experience or even more, more than that. Um, when you have a heavenly encounter of any kind, one of the things that you immediately notice that's just mind-blowing how different it is from this world is the peace that's there. The peace in heaven, right? And I've had a, I've had a few experiences like that. I, I know I shared with you some of them. One of, one of them was, uh, oh, one time I was, I was in a church service and suddenly uh, I was just taken into what was, is the, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb. You know, I was just taken into that place. I just suddenly was you know, I was still physically in the church. It was a little church in Mexico. We were doing a mission outreach. And suddenly, I was in 
the wedding supper of the Lamb, seated at this long table with gold and silver and crystal and plates and purple and amazing and amazing, amazing. And there was wine in the goblets, you know, and I remember thinking, I don't know if I can drink that wine because I have to go to those meetings, you know. And, and, uh, and Jesus was sitting across from me and smiling at me. And that was cool because he was sitting across from everybody at the same time. And I don't know how he did that. <laughs> he was smiling at me and he just thought at me. He didn't speak. He just thought at me. You can drink the wine in heaven. <laughs> no harm, <laughs> you know. It's just pure joy. It's just pure, you know. And I, and I, and I just, but, but uh, you know, there's a lot more to that. But the, the whole point that I really wanted to share is that in that experience, the peace that I felt there is supernatural. It's beyond, beyond anything this world has. It's just beyond. In this world, there's always just... You know, there's anxiety, or there's, there's a sadness, or there's gloom, or there's something. It just floats in the air, you know? And even as Christians, I mean, we, we can repel a whole lot of it. But it's in the world, isn't it? It's just, it's just in the atmosphere of this world, you know? But, but in heaven, it is absolutely not there. There is the most amazing peace that is just to the, just penetrates the core of your being. And there's not the slightest sense of anxiety or worry or self-consciousness or sadness or anything it's just not there it's just it's just amazing peace and amazing joy the joy just permeates your cells your, your spirit everything just joy just love and all at the same time this is truly one fruit love and joy and peace it's one fruit all together and it just goes together you know and uh, maybe they're in order maybe you experience the love first when you when you begin to experience God's presence maybe the first thing that you do experience is love Love, but really it's one fruit you know and the joy and the peace comes and, and it's just but but the whole the whole point I wanted to say again is that this verse is an essential revelation of God's nature and I remember you know how many have ever heard of a famous sermon called uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God ever anybody ever heard of that sermon? it was like from 17 or 1800s I don't remember it, you know two or three hundred years ago famous evangelist preached that sermon and you know lots of people got saved because it, you know it was one of those thundering hellfire and brimstone kind of you know Know, sermons and tons of people got saved because they were scared to death uh, and the man was anointed the man was anointed uh, but but the ter but the whole you know the whole uh what title of that message sinners in the hands of an angry god you know t if you listen to that title it tells you that god's essential nature is he's angry he's always aware of sin and he's always angry at sin you know and is that really a reflection or a revelation of god's essential nature no. Galatians 5.22 <laughs> is a revelation of God's essential nature. When he lives in you, he is and will produce love, joy, and peace. Now, the, uh, the other parts of this... Of this uh, well, let me, let me also um, talk about emotions for a second, too, just because I think it's important. Um, anybody ever get mad? Sad, frustrated, sure, absolutely. And if you read, um, you know, in the Bible stories of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you, uh, did Jesus have human emotions? Absolutely, absolutely. Was he grieved sometime? Yeah, he was grieved at the Pharisees, their hardness of heart, their religiosity, their lack of care and compassion for people. Jesus was grieved. He was even angry, right? When he went into the temple, didn't it say that he, he was so angry by the, the whole commercial, you know, thing that he took a, a cord and began just turning over tables and just, you know, whipping up on the plate. I mean, Jesus got angry, you know? Is that a contradiction to the fact that he is essentially love, joy, and peace by nature? It's really not. Jesus had normal human emotions, and his emotions were motivated by love. Have you ever gotten angry at your child because you love them, and they're doing something that's hurtful to themselves or others, right? And, and is there any contradiction to this at all? You love your child and you get angry at them. Is there any contradiction? Probably not, unless you're an angry person who just gets mad all the time. Then you have a problem, right? <laughs> but if you love your child and you're essentially a loving person, you will get angry sometimes, won't you? Absolutely. And there was no contradiction there. And Jesus ha experienced anger. Jesus experienced grief and sadness sometimes. He experienced, you know, um, distress. When he was right before ready to go to the cross, it says that he was sweating blood he was distressed he was in even an agony it describes at one point was he just feeling joy all the time I'm gonna die on this cross hallelujah no I mean he had human emotions and sometimes you know sometimes Christians we get we feel guilty for having emotions you know don't let your emotions control you but they're human Jesus had them it's part of the human experience you know but um, but emotions are kind of shallow 
and pretty much temporary and usually very conditional, right? Jesus didn't feel sadness all the time. He didn't feel anger all the time. It was just conditional and temporary. And that was okay and appropriate, you know, for, for the time. But, but when Jesus basically was just communing with God, right, and uh, going about his business, what did he experience most of the time? Joy. Love and peace. And, you know, and if you watch the, you know, the old movies about Jesus, the st you know, and he speaks King James English always in the movies, right? And, and he walks around and he's always got this very stern, religious kind of English accent. You know, you know what I'm talking about? And, and very blessed are they. And I don't, see, I don't think Jesus was like that at all, quite honestly. I think that he always had a smile on his face. I think that he was erupting with joy most of the time. When he was talking, that's my image, that's my picture of Jesus. When he was talking, blessed are those right, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they'll be filled. I mean, I think that he was radiating joy most of the time. That's what drew people to him. If he was always sour and, you know, rigid and religious looking and speaking, you know, would he have, would he have attracted all those people? Not really. <laughs> Not really, you know. Jesus was full of joy. It erupted from him. Sure, there was times he got angry. Sure, there was times he was distressed and grieved. Absolutely human emotions. But, but he walked in joy. And it's the same thing for you as you let God live inside of you right, and, you know, and his nature and character grow inside of you. Yeah, you'll have emotions and you'll have, you know, Sure, sure, but, but really what's, what's in your spirit, not a, not a conditional emotion, but just a spiritual essence and nature inside of you and will bubble up again and again and again is that joy. Amen? That joy. It's just, it's just going to be there. And if you've been frustrated with something and you go and you get alone with God, I know from experience, maybe you too, God, I just released this stuff to you. I'm, you know, got some frustrations and some concerns and whatever, and I just, here, here they are. Here they are. Take them. God, just touch me and love on me and right and within a minute or so you know what you know what's there again joy <laughs> because it's on the inside it's the prevailing force you know it's just it's very very cool um, now the, the rest of these the rest of the list long suffering is essentially a description of uh, patience it's really saying you know you're, you're uh, you love someone and you put up with a lot because you love them and you're patient. That's what long-suffering means. You know what I'm saying? Right. And then kindness and goodness and uh, faithfulness. Aren't these all just a way of interpreting the first thing on the list, which is love? I mean, if you love somebody, will you be patient with them? Yeah, and, and walk with them through, through all kinds of stuff that maybe someone who didn't love them wouldn't put up with, but you love them and you put up with stuff that other people wouldn't, right? And you're patient and you have, you know, a heart for them. And, and that's love. And if you're kind towards people, isn't that love just being interpreted and expressed? And if you're good and faithful, isn't that love? You see, what, and so a lot of the rest of these things on the list, 23 also, go ahead. Uh, verse 23 continues the, the thought. Uh, gentleness and self-control and and isn't this just love interpreted again and expressed in a certain way so really if you boil it right down love joy and peace is really the the big three there isn't it and everything else is how love is expressed and interpreted and and love joy and peace is really one fruit that just is the essential nature of God it really is. And why is this important right now? Why are we even sharing this? Because um, I think that one of, the most, one of the most important things that we always need as, as believers, as Christians, is to know, truly know God's heart, right? To know his essential nature and character. Because if you have a wrong image of God, it'll translate into wrong beliefs, won't it? And it'll translate into a, a relationship that is not healthy relationship that's somehow toxic or limited or you know whatever it is it's tainted it's corrupt but if you have a, a pure and a clear image of who God is yes he's holy yes he's majesty yes he's creator yes he's all you know yes 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 but but his essential heart of who God is in his heart is love joy and peace it's his nature it truly is. And when you have that revelation of his nature, it affects how you see him and relate to him. Right? And, uh, and everything it's, is based on truth, right? It's be, all right, let's, let's, let's move on a little bit. Um, 2 Peter 1, uh, 1 through 4. I just, I'm going after two words here. 
Uh, it says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's a real cool idea there too, by the way. Bondservant is, is as low as you get, and an apostle is as high as you get in the church. So what is Peter saying there? <laughs> the, uh, he laid down his life as a bondservant, right? And God used him as an apostle. Um, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go ahead. Uh, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. There's, there's the same, excuse me, the same idea again just a little bit. In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as you get to know God in truth, who he really is and who Jesus really is in truth, one of the things that will happen to you is what? Grace and peace will be multiplied to you. Yeah, as you know God, who he is, this is absolutely connected. Grace and peace comes. Three, three, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, really headed for verse four, so by which uh, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, the promises of the gospel and eternal life and the kingdom and all of those things, so that through these through these promises, through God's word, you may be, here's what I was going after, partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through love. So um, in, in the world, what we were born into corruption, right? and that corruption affected our nature and who we were. But it says when you get born again, you just escaped the corruption. Really, I escaped the whole thing because I feel, still feel some of it hanging on. <laughs> no, God says you escaped it, right? You're, you're getting, right? you're new on the inside, your mind is getting renewed, and when Jesus comes back, you get a new body and the whole thing is complete, amen? But, but the moment you said yes to Jesus, in God's mind, it's done. You're, you can say you're escaping or you escaped, but in God's mind, it's done. And you're born again. And now he says, a new thing happened is now you just became a partaker of the divine nature. Where does that happen? In your spirit, in your heart, right? You now are sharing in the nature of God. That's the divine nature, right? You're sharing in the nature of God. It's become, it's become part of who you are now. Because if isn't uh, the child born of the nature of the parent, right? And dogs have puppies and cats have kitties and... God produces us born-again children with his nature, right? And dogs will chase the car, and cat will sleep on the windowsill and, you know, look at you. And it's just their nature, right? And, right? and we are the sons of God, and the nature, they have the divine nature in us. And the divine nature is essentially, at its core and heart, love, joy, and peace. Hallelujah. Amen. And that's what's going to be produced inside of you. That's the real deal. Wow. And you just can't fake that for more than about 30 seconds, can you? <laughs> you know, it's just, that's the real thing. So you're a partaker of the divine nature. When did that happen? The moment you got born again. Let's read that. John chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. You know that story, right? I don't preach on this too often. Uh, but uh, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. No one can do the signs that you do unless God is with them. We know you're from God, but really, who are you, right? That's what he's asking. Come on, who are you? And Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Don't you love how Jesus answers questions? Right? Who are you? You've got to be born again. <laughs> <laughs> Could we go back to my question? No. <laughs> I'm changing the subject. <laughs> you got to be born again. <laughs> and uh, this, this uh, can we stay on three for a second, please? Uh, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Again, another really interesting thought is if you can't see the kingdom of God without being born again, once you're born again, can you see the kingdom of God? Do you have to wait till you die and go to heaven? Or can you see the kingdom of God? immediately after being born again. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Your spiritual eyes are opened. You're renewed. You're reconnected to heaven. The moment you're born again, you can see, discern, and understand spiritual things. And you can begin to see and understand what God is doing, what God is saying, how God is moving in the world. Your heart has just come alive. You can see now, right? You have spiritual eyes and senses. Um, the moment you get born again. And uh, the other cool thing about this is uh, the, the, the word born again, uh, if you look up the, the Greek word that's translated as again here, 
it's, um, it's equally translated in the New Testament as from above. Uh, it's used in a lot of different places. For instance, even when, um, when Jesus died on the cross, you know, and it said that the veil of the temple was torn, it, it used this word that here is translated as again, but there it's translated as the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, from above down. Really interesting. And then in James chapter 3, it talks about the wisdom that comes from above. If you're, if you're familiar with that passage, it says the wisdom that comes from above is pure and peaceable and good, right? And, and that word in James 3, from above, is the same word translated again here. So my point is that really that word is translated at least like five or six times in the New Testament as from above, and it literally means from above. So some of the Bible versions will, will translate this as you must be born from above born from heaven, okay? That's very, very, very cool. It's a very legitimate translation. Um, and, uh, but anyway, so when you're born again, you're born from above, and then you can see the kingdom of God, all right? Go ahead. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? All right, you're ignoring my question, so let's go with yours. All right, <laughs> so how do you get born again? I don't get it, right? <laughs> go ahead. There's th and five, Jesus answered, uh, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Again, so being born of water, that's, that's generated some debate in the Christian world. Does that mean you have to be water baptized? I don't believe so. Um, some, someone said, well, that, the water is always a symbol for the word. Okay, but I, I don't think that's what he means. I think that he means that when you're born physically in the womb, guess what the baby is surrounded by? Water. And guess what? When water breaks, guess who's ready to come out <laughs> into the world, right? <laughs> Baby's coming, right? And I believe literally it's talking about physical birth, being born out of the womb and water, and then, then being born again by the Spirit the second time. All right? that's, that's my understanding of that. And so you must be born physically, and then you must later be born spiritually because we're born as a member of the fallen human race. And he said, if you don't get born of the Spirit, then you can't enter the kingdom of God. So so again, the opposite would be true. The moment you get born again, are you waiting to enter the kingdom of God or are you immediately in the kingdom of God? <laughs> you're immediately in the kingdom of God. You have entered in. The moment you get born again, you're in the kingdom. All right. You've literally, quite literally, got one foot in heaven, one foot on earth. I mean, you know, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, you're seated in heavenly places, right? Yeah, and you're also walking here. And uh, so you're, you're literally in two realms at the same time again. And uh, go ahead, verse 6 then. It says, uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's why, this verse is why I think that when he says being born of water, he means the water in the womb. Because he repeats the idea, as God frequently does, what's born of the flesh is flesh and has the nature of flesh. And if it was corrupted by Adam and Eve's sin, what's born of that is going to be corrupted flesh. Flesh itself is not evil, by the way. Right? After, after uh, was Jesus' flesh evil? No, his flesh was never corrupted by sin, uh, right? And after, after you get uh, resurrected in a new body, will it be flesh? Yes. Will it be ever corrupted by sin in any way? Nope. It'll be. So flesh itself is not evil. The physical world is not evil. Flesh is not evil in any way. It was this, the corruption of sin, right? It was the disease of sin that infected, right? But nevertheless, he says, that which is born of the fallen race of Adam's children is the, of the nature of Adam of flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. When you receive Jesus, right, the Holy Spirit comes in and, and you're born again of his nature. So again, you're not just like adopted and forgiven. You're literally born born of God's DNA, right? and you literally are partaker of the divine nature, and the essential divine nature is love, joy, and peace, and that becomes part of who you are on the inside, literally. You're born of the Spirit, and I think seven finishes up this thought. Uh, so he says, do not marvel that I said you must be born again or born from above. All right. Um, jump to Psalm, Psalm 16. Verse 11. I'm going to give you a few other, because um, I really, really want to talk about joy. We talk about love a lot, um, but I really want to talk about joy. Because I wanted to get into your heart that the God's essential nature is joy. Because just Christians just miss that point a lot, right? You know, we're going to church now. Everybody stop laughing and stop smiling. We're going to church now. 
really? <laughs> How did we get that all turned around? <laughs> right? No, I mean, you know what I'm saying? We, we're, what did Jesus say? To enter the kingdom, you must become like little children. children. You know what children love to do? <laughs> Laugh. Yeah, children, if you, if you just let them be children before, before sin really you know, takes over their nature, and it, it does eventually, you know, but, but when they're little and they're just kind of pure and it hasn't really happened yet, you know what just bubbles out of children? Joy. It just bubbles out of them everywhere. I mean, you know, butterfly flies by. Ah, here's a new toy. Ah, you know, everything's fun. You know, you have, to, you have to retrain them. Stop laughing. Stop smiling. No more fun. Time to grow up. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, they've got that nature of God in them, you know, until sin, you know, corrupts it and until we sometimes, you know, beat it out of them, you know, but, but they've, got the, they've got that joy at first. Um, now, look at Psalm 1611. Uh, David wrote this, you will show me, God, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. Phew. David had this revelation. I don't know how he had it. Did he have heavenly experiences? I think so. I think so. David knew the presence of God. He knew the anointing of God. He was a prophet and a king. And, and uh, the, you know, in the presence of God, what David described and experienced was fullness of joy. Not just feeling a little bit better. Right? Fullness of joy. And that's interesting because David, um, you know, David had such an easy life. You know, um, he was called to be king of Israel at, what, 15, 16 years old, went to the service of the king, King Saul at the time, who immediately got jealous of him and after, well, at least after a few years, got jealous of him and spent the next 15 years trying to hunt down and kill David. <laughs> and if you spent 15 years hiding in the desert from the king who was trying to kill you, you, you can't lay claim to an easy life, right? And David said, yeah, but in your presence, God, you know what I come back to again and again in your presence is fullness of joy. And when you're in the presence of God, what's it like in heaven? What's it like in heaven, really? Because I know that people have the idea sometimes. You go to heaven where God is, and, and everybody's going to be walking on eggshells because you don't want to say the wrong thing because, man, he's God, and he could just, you know. No, in, in his presence is fullness of joy. God is love, joy, and peace. It's his essential nature. When you're born again, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Right? And in, in heaven, his presence fills and permeates all of heaven. There's not a corner of heaven <laughs> where the, the atmosphere is not filled with joy. There ain't a corner of heaven that doesn't have joy. <laughs> Everywhere. And it doesn't wear out. Joy. Joy, joy. <laughs> and the more you know God, the more you walk in joy, even in the face of difficulties and challenges. Amen? And Jesus, what promised in this world, you will have tribulation, you will have troubles. But joy, right? What else? In uh, uh, Psalm 45, verse 6 and 7, it's a real cool little verse also. Uh, I believe this was David also. He said, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. We've got to read this one. Read both verses and then read it again. He says, You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Okay, what? Go back to verse 6. Let's figure out what he's talking about here. Because this is a really super interesting little, little portion of Scripture. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. You know um, who David is talking about? It's Jesus. But he calls him God. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. How do we know we're talking about Jesus as opposed to the Father? Verse 7 again. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you, God, <laughs> with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Did you get it? Because verse uh, 6 said, your throne, O God, right, is... Uh, go, go, do it again. Do it again. Check this out. It's so cool. Verse 6, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. We know he's talking to Jesus, don't we? He calls him God, okay? And then verse 7, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God... Your, 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 God, your Father God has anointed you, God, 
<laughs> with the oil of gladness. Who is Jesus anointed with? The Holy Spirit, right? And, and, and here it describes Jesus being anointed by the Holy Spirit as being anointed by the oil of gladness, joy, above more than his companions, above everybody else in the world, Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness. That's another way of saying Jesus was always the happiest guy in the room. Right? And, but I love this verse because it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And God, your God, has anointed you, God, with God. God the Father has anointed you, God the Son, with God the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and the result is joy. <laughs> the result is joy. The result is you're the happiest guy in the room all, everywhere you go. <laughs> this is quoted in Hebrews uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 7 through 9. I, I want to read it there too. And because in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, he's talking about, he's comparing um, angels to Jesus because there was a misunderstanding. You know, at the time, some people were saying, well, Jesus was an angel. No, he's not. He's not an angel. And so all of Hebrews chapter 1 compares Jesus and angels. It goes back and forth. Jesus is this. Angels are this. And it, it makes it very, very clear. So here, I'm just jumping into the middle of that, that flow. And he says, of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Angels are uh, servants. They're ministers. All right? Go ahead. But to the Son, he says, in other words, he's not an angel. He's, right? he's the Son of God. He's God incarnate. To the Son, he says, your, th now, your throne, O God. Are we sure we're talking about Jesus here? Yes. To the Son, he says. Who says? God the Father says. To the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. <laughs> scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. <laughs> Again, God the Father has anointed you, God the Son, with God the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and the result is uh, gladness and joy. You're the happiest guy in the room everywhere you go. <laughs> and, but it also says Jesus right, represents the essential nature of the Father. And he says you love righteousness and you hate wickedness. You hate lawlessness. Can you hate wickedness and still be full of joy? Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. He, Jesus loved goodness, justice, kindness, mercy, truth, compassion. He loves those things. He loves righteousness. He loves fairness. He loves goodness, right? He hates wickedness. He hates oppression. He hates injustice. He hates cruelty. He hates dishonesty. He hates cheating. He hates violence. He hates all that. And it says the essential nature of God, right? And it says, therefore, God the Father anointed you with God the Holy Spirit. And you love goodness and you hate wickedness and you're still the happiest guy in the room. <laughs> So Jesus wasn't walking around all the time going, I hate wickedness. He was walking around full of joy. <laughs> full of joy everywhere he went. Everywhere he went. That's why people wanted to get close to him. I get close to you and I feel something. <laughs> what do you feel? Feels good. <laughs> feels like love. Feels like joy. Feels like peace. I don't get, get, walk away from you. I don't feel that anymore. Can I walk next to you? <laughs> oh, could you come and live inside of my heart? That would be even better. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> hmm. Zephaniah 3, verse 14 to 17. There's a promise of a prophecy that when God's people are redeemed. He was talking to Israel, you know, because they had been numerous times they were conquered by their enemies and lost their homeland and their city and their temple and, uh, because of uh, generations of sin. Anyway, then God would bring them back. He would restore them back to their land. And so this is what God says, when his people are restored, and this is for us too, when we're saved, when we're redeemed and restored, saying, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem and the church. The Lord has taken away your judgments Yea, he has cast out your enemy. Yea, the king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. This is also a millennial prophecy, too, when the enemy, Satan, will literally be locked away. Go ahead. And then he says, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, 
will save. He will what? <laughs> Rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. <laughs> this is so cool because, you know, this is an Old Testament prophecy and a lot, of the, a lot of the nature of the Old Testament prophecies, we do know, right, if you read the Old Testament, you know, God is sometimes thundering against sin and against unrighteousness and against idolatry and all the things that, you know, that mankind kept doing, Israel and the whole human race. He just was thundering against this stuff. But if you remember, it was the Old Testament. It was a revelation of the fallen nature of man and our desperate need for a Savior. Okay? And so, does God, who is love, joy, and peace, does God himself, the Father, get angry at sin? Yes. He loves righteousness and hates wickedness. Absolutely, he gets angry. Do you get angry? It's it, <laughs> it, um, injustice too. You do, you do. I, I hope so. And uh, but he says, when, when his people are saved and redeemed and in his presence, rescued and, and saved, and he's there among us, what is he going to do? His essential nature comes forth. Is he going to sit there and say, all right, I saved you, but don't you ever mess up again. I'm watching you close now. Is that what he says? No. He says, I saved you. The enemy is gone. Your sin is removed. The judgments are removed. You're safe. You're rescued. I'm living in your midst now. He will rejoice over you with gladness. His essential nature comes forth. God himself rejoices over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love like a, like, a, like a mother would hold a child who's crying until they sleep. <laughs> he will rejoice over you with singing. God will sing for joy over you. <laughs> it's his essential nature will come forth and he can be fully who he wants to be with us. <laughs> wow. It also says, uh, uh, skip the Luke 10 one, go to John 15, 9 through 12. Uh, Jesus said during his ministry, as the Father loved me, I've also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. Remember that Jesus just gave us, he's not talking about the 10 commandments here, right? He gave us two commandments. Believe in me, love one another as I love you. Keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his, his love. Go ahead. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy... What, what did he say? These things I have spoken to you so that... I, what I want to point out here, by the way, he didn't just say so that you would have some joy. He said so that you would have my joy. My joy may remain in you and then your joy will be full. So it's not just some joy. It's not just any joy. It's not random general joy. He says, my joy, <laughs> my divine essential nature joy, I want it to be inside of you. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons I came. <laughs> so you could have that joy restored. He said, you're going to have trouble in the world, but I'm, I've overcome, right? And I'm going to give you joy. And you're, that joy is even going to be with you in this world. And in the presence of the Lord, fullness of joy forever. Amen? But your joy may be full. Uh, also jump up to, uh, let's see, just jump up to John 17, 13. He said the same thing up there. Now I come to you. Uh, he's, he's, this is Jesus praying. This is his prayer right before he goes to the cross. He's praying to the Father one last time before the cross. And he says, now I come to you, Father. And these things I speak in the world so that they may have what? My joy. Not just some joy, not just any joy, right? My joy. Fulfilled in themselves. The essential nature and being of God. <laughs> living inside of us. Is joy supernatural? <laughs> Please say yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Joy is supernatural. It's heavenly. It's, it's from God. It's an amazing thing. Uh, Genesis 21, just put up verse 5 and 6. This is pretty interesting too. I'll close here. And then we'll...
Uh, the story of Abraham, of course, we know the story of Abraham. It's so foundational for us um, in the Bible and as Christians. And uh, one of the things that was interesting uh, about the story of Abraham, I don't usually point out, it says that, uh, you know, God uh, first made the promise to Abraham when he was, what, 75 or so? You know, he'd be father of a multitude. And then he had Ishmael, and, you know, that was kind of his own doing, and that was a mistake, apparently. And, uh, and then God appeared when Abraham was 99, and Sarah was 90. <laughs> and God said, um, this time next year, Abraham, you're going to have a son by your wife, Sarah. <laughs> this is in Genesis chapter 17. And Abraham's 99. <laughs> Sarah's 90. It said God literally appeared to him and visited him in the form of the angel of the Lord, right? And, and spoke to him and said, a year from now, Abraham, mark it on your calendar. You're going to have a son. You're going to have a boy with your wife, Sarah. And you know what Abraham did? It's in Genesis 17. You should look it up. It said he fell on his face and he laughed. <laughs> he fell on his face. I should have put the verse up there. And he laughed. <laughs> Keep in mind, he's literally standing in front of God, the angel of the Lord, right? Ma manifested physically, visibly to him, speaking to him, giving him a promise face to face in an audible voice in person, saying, next year I'm gonna, you're going to have a son with Sarah. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be kidding me. <laughs> <You gotta> <laughs> and God said, no, and you're going to name him Isaac. You know what Isaac means? Laughter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Abraham's laugh at that point wasn't exactly a laugh of faith, was it? It was kind of like, hey, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, you made me this promise when I was 75. I'm 99 now. Give it up. Okay, it's just, you know, come on. <laughs> and, uh, and then he appeared to Sarah, uh, or he actually appeared again, it said a few months later, and, uh, and, he, and he made him the same promise. And he said, nine months from now, right, your, your, your wife Sarah is going to have a baby and uh, it says that Sarah was listening inside the house she wasn't actually out there she was listening inside the house and when she heard that nine months from now Sarah's gonna have a baby it said that Sarah laughed <laughs> she, and it said, Sarah said shall I have pleasure in my me and my Lord being old now my Lord being old also in other words Sarah said I don't even think we can do it <laughs> And I don't even think it'll feel good. <laughs> and it certainly won't produce a baby. <laughs> it was like, she just laughed. It's like, no way. Are you kidding me? And, and God heard her and said, did you laugh? And she said, no. <laughs> I didn't laugh. <laughs> he said, you did laugh. You're going to name the baby Isaac. Laughter. <laughs> but both of their laughs were not really laughs of faith, were they? They were laughs of, ah, you've got to be kidding. Nine months later, <laughs> they have a baby and God said remember his name <laughs> Isaac laughter and then here Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him in verse 6 and Sarah said God has made me laugh <laughs> this is real laughter this is not this is not that you got to be kidding laughter this is the real thing like this is joy this is amazing this is look what God did <laughs> and and she said all who hear will laugh with me that was a prophetic statement because all who hear the gospel all who hear the message of the Lord will what laugh will laugh really we're not going to get all sour and religious no you'll laugh <laughs> Joy will erupt inside of you when, when you invite him to come and live in your heart. You laugh, right? And Isaac is really a prophetic picture of the church because it said, you know, Isaac was born of promise. He was born of the Spirit. That's in Galatians. And Isaac is really a picture of the church. Isaac was named laughter. <laughs> we celebrate, we laugh, we rejoice in what God has done. Amen. Wow. How cool. Ready to pray? Yeah. All right, let's pray. I just wanted to have some fun with that today. What I, let's, let's pray if we stand together with me. If you're, you know, if you're not comfortable standing, that's okay. But, uh, but otherwise, let's... <laughs> what I want to do is just activate our faith and open our hearts. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So as you, as you get a revelation of God's nature, of joy, of His essential true nature, 
love and joy and peace. And as you see that and know that and, and begin to get a revelation of that, it says grace and peace will be multiplied to you and, and joy will be multiplied to you. It'll bubble up inside of you. It'll erupt inside of you. Hallelujah. 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 Welcome, Holy Spirit. As we receive your word, the word of your joy, not just an emotion, not just a feeling, God, but a supernatural spiritual force and an essential part of your nature, your essence, who you are, your being. God, imparted into everybody here. Joy, joy, joy. Joy. Joy in the face of any circumstance, good or difficult. Joy, joy. Give people right now a revelation, God, that your nature, your essential nature is joy. Wash away worries, cares, burdens. We all have those. We pick them up. We, we work on them a little bit sometimes. God says, oh, lay them down. Just lay them down. So just, just surrender right now and shake it off or lift it up to heaven or whatever you do. Just, just shake off, release, surrender, burdens, worries, cares, any heaviness. Just shake it off and let joy just pour in you right now. Let joy bubble up inside of you. God's presence. <laughs> Hallelujah. citizen of heaven, a partaker of the divine nature, a born from above person. Hallelujah. prophetic act with me. There's a goblet from the wedding supper of the Lamb full of wine from heaven. It's joy. It's His presence and His joy. Just take out, to reach out your hand if you want to do that prophetically. Don't worry about anybody else. Just, just go ahead and look silly. Like a child. Just reach out and take that goblet of wine from the, the table of the wedding supper. And just drink it in. Drink in the wine of His joy, His love, His peace, His presence. Drink it in. Drink it in. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sitting at the wedding supper of the Lamb, Jesus is sitting across from you, smiling rejoicing over you rejoicing over you with gladness rejoicing over you with singing quieting you with his love comforting you rejoicing over you have some more wine <laughs> you can have all you want it's heaven's wine his joy. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, I command anything that is 
not of God be broken off of these precious people right now. Anything that's heavy or oppressing or, or in any way come to do them harm, I break their power and assignment. I command them to go in Jesus' name. Jesus came that we might have life, have it abundantly right now. Jesus, touch each person from their head to their toe. Touch them that life, joy, glory pour into them. Healing, blessing, restoration, sound mind, power and love. Pour into them, pour into them, Jesus. Angels of God come and minister to God's people. Makes his servants, his ministers, a flame of fire. Winds and flames of fire. Angels of God come and minister to God's people right now. another moment please I feel like um, just can we pray for healing again as a group if you're next to somebody or you want to slide over just put your hand on their shoulder or join hands with someone just just at least one person slide over and pray for somebody don't be shy nobody will reject you just you can <laughs> it's alright pray for somebody just put your hand on their shoulder maybe just begin to Release the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I pray healing in Jesus' name. Anybody right now that is suffering any sickness, any disease, any bacteria, any virus, any tumor, any growth, any injury, any wound, any spirit of infirmity, in the name of Jesus Christ, we command spirit of infirmity, go. Sickness, go. Disease, go. Be removed. Be gone. Affliction, go. Torment, go. In Jesus' name, anything that comes to steal, kill, or destroy, go in Jesus' name. Lord, we lay hands on one another. We release your anointing, your healing anointing. He flow into people's joints, in their bodies, any place there's a wound and an injury. We command viral and bacterial infections to die and be removed in Jesus' name. Lord, and let your anointing flow into people's bodies. Heal and restore anything affected, anything been diseased or harmed. Lord, flow into people's organs, restoring the functioning of their organs. If there's any disease that has attacked their organs or their bodily tissue, we command the disease to be removed now in the name of Jesus. We say, Lord, let your healing anointing restore their organs. We call new organs from heaven for people that need new organs right now in Jesus' name. Hearts, lungs, pancreas, liver, kidneys, stomach, I don't, any organs, any organ. We call them in in Jesus' name. We call in new, new tissue for people where there's been damaged tissue. We call in cartilage for joints. We call in cushions for backs and spines. We call in body parts and tissues. Holy Spirit, we speak creative miracles. Restore body parts. Heal body parts. Restore bodies from damage disease or wounds. Healing power of God work in everybody's life right now as we pray. Jesus, you are our healer, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Migraine headaches, go in Jesus' name. Jesus touching migraine headaches, go. If you get a word of knowledge, you can actually just lift up your voice and speak it out. If there's something God is impressing on you right now that He is healing sovereignly, just, just speak it out. Healing immune 
immune systems. All right. All right. If you have uh, any immune system disorder, just specifically right now, receive healing for that. In Jesus' name, be healed right now. I did hear migraines a, moment, a few moments ago. If you've suffered migraines or suffer migraines, just receive that healing right now in Jesus' name. Immune system, anything else? You don't have to wait for a word of knowledge, by the way. Just believe God for your healing. But it's kind of cool when God speaks something out that uh, you know is you. Thank you, Lord, your love pouring through people's bodies, through their souls. Right now, right now. You speak your healing miracles. Doctors' reports being changed. Or supernaturally accelerated recoveries. In Jesus' name. Again, any, any oppressive spirit, I feel that again. If there's something that just, some oppressive spirit that seems to be like a shadow that follows you, that uh, just wants to rob your joy, we rebuke it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is joy incarnate. He is joy made flesh, joy manifested from the presence of God, the Messiah, we command in the name of Jesus Christ, any oppressive spirit, release God's people now and let joy come and heal and set free. Thank you, Lord. Angels ministering. Angels ministering. Angels, angels bring healing also. God sends them. Sometimes they rewire your nervous system. <laughs> they can just do that. They just, angels can bring healing. Sometimes they bring new body parts from heaven. They rewire nerves. <laughs> they reset bones and muscles. Angels can do cool stuff. God sends them. in the room <laughs> born of the spirit children of laughter amen god bless you love you guys